yeah. Okay, I think now it's, it's fine. So it's always a pleasure to be here at uh, the INT in Seattle. And uh, so what I'm going to tell you is particle dynamics at, or better to say, above the threshold. And that is, uh, as a phenomenon, certainly quite, uh, uh, quite general and uh, not related to a particular system. And therefore, one should expect and one should certainly have methods which are good to describe those phenomena in, uh, in all possible systems, quantum systems, like atomic, nuclear, and hadronic systems. And if you look here to the scales which are involved, you see there's a large spread of scales, definitely in binding energies and sizes and so, and so on. Uh, since I'm coming from nuclear physics, uh, let me give you a little bit of historical, kind of historical background. All of us who are working in nuclear physics, they know that the description of nuclear ground states is already a demanding task if you really want to be precise, accurate, and uh, so to say, starting from first principles. And uh, in already in the late 60s, one was very uh, <coughs> demanding also on the uh, excited states of nuclei. So the shell model is certainly doing well. Nuclear many body theory provides appropriate methods, but all those methods have to be properly adjusted if you go above particle threshold, because that is an additional complication. You have open channels, that means particles are escaping to infinity, and this requires particular methods to analyze spectroscopy above the particle threshold, and we will see there are similar phenomena to be considered also in well, in confined systems like hadrons, which are not typical, not usual bound states as we know it from the other systems. So what I'm going to talk about, these Fano resonances, that is another word, so to say, for quantum interference in microscopic systems. And we know all quantum interference is a unique, it is a general phenomenon, not unique to a particular system, but a general phenomenon for all quantum systems. And uh, the Fano approach, as we will see, provides us the methods to study those things in unbound states above the particle threshold. So, and, um, as I said, I'll discuss a bit Fano resonance in atoms, so to say, kind of following the historical approach to those phenomena because. Uh, Ugo Fano was developing those methods initially for the first time in the early 60s in order to describe uh, self-ionizing states in atomic physics, like the self-ionization of excited states of helium. I will show an example, then the historical example. Then this became of interest also for continuum spectroscopy in nuclei. In the late 60s, there was Maho and Weidenmüller. They were working quite a bit on those uh, methods to develop. At that time, certainly the computational uh, possibilities were quite low. So in the late 60s was essentially paperwork and maybe some desk table calculators. So there were no big calculations done. So that is changed certainly later, and uh, so that. Uh, now one can think about to extend the spectroscopy into the continuum region. Why is that important in nuclear physics? That is certainly of high interest because these rare isotope facilities are being able to produce very weakly bound nuclei where the separation energy is not as in stable nuclei of the order of 10 MeV but of the order of 100 keV. So that means one is suddenly coming into separation energy conditions which are similar to the atomic case. And this closeness to the continuum, that means to the particle threshold, requires particular methods to describe those systems. And then I will show you uh, also these quantum interference effects and similar phenomena in an uh, example for hadron physics, namely in the charm sector. Charm mesons are located, say, around 3 GeV. So that is, say, 100 keV, 10 MeV, 3 GeV. That are the scales which we are going to discover. So what is the 
spectral or physical situation. There is some closed channel, some excited state of the system sitting, which is in such a configuration where it has a total positive energy, but none of the particles has by itself an energy lifting it above particle threshold. And so the, such a state cannot decay by itself. It's blocked simply because there's no asymptotic flux going out. But since this is uh, at a positive energy, it's immersed into a continuum of simpler configurations, namely in the simple case of a scattering state, say an electron with an atom, a nucleon with a core nucleus in its ground state, or a meson-meson correlation state in hadron physics. So, and that is the situation which we have. So, and this state is talking by some residual interaction with this, uh, well, environment of unbound states. There might be also some uh, bound states, so it might also mix with those bound states here below threshold. And <coughs> a historical one was calling those states, the bound states, embedded into the continuum, taking care or by naming, including into the name the bound state nature of this state and this embeddedness into the continuum. So what are the examples? As I said already, in atomic physics we have these self-ionizing states which consist of multi-electron configurations just uh, fulfilling this condition which I was discussing. None of the electrons is above threshold, but the sum of these two electron energies and plus the correlation energy certainly put the state above threshold. In nuclei, again, there are multi-particle hole states possible which are of the similar type. In mesons, there one has confined QQ bar quark anti quark configurations embedded in the continuum of meson meson scattering states. Examples are the, well, this belongs down here. For the mesons, this is, for example, the famous rho meson, which is a pi pi resonance, or the F0, the F0 meson which is a mixture of pi pi and kk bar resonances. So k mesons is kind of a hidden strangeness state. And there, is, uh, are there are other examples like these uh, charmed states above 3 uh, GeV. So it's these unknown x uh, states. I will discuss that later. There are also examples in the baryonic sector. So these are confined QQ three quark configurations which are embedded to the continuum of meson nucleon scattering. And that the famous, <coughs> the most famous case is the delta resonance 12 at located at about 300 MeV above the nucleon ground state. But there are other examples which can be discussed or understood in the same way as the famous Roper resonance, which is the uh, spin isospin partner of the nucleon ground state, and but also here more exotic uh, baryons like the lambda 1405, which is a strangeness carrying stage and is coupling to the nucleon uh, kaon scattering continuum. So there are other examples. What are these uh, number in the parentheses? Sorry? What are the number in the parentheses? Oh, these are, that is uh, the hadronic, hadron physics spectroscopic notation. That is the energy, the mass of the resonance, the peak energy of the resonance, the pole energy, better to say. In MeV, exactly. Yeah. Also here, that's always MeV. And the nucleon, just to define the scales, the nucleon is at 938 MeV. So that is 300 MeV above 500, about 500. Is it a very sharp thing? No, that is, well, I mean, it has a width of 120 MeV, so it's 10% of its uh, mass position or pole position. And uh, in that sense, you can consider it as a sharp resonance. But uh, other resonances like those here in the charm sector, as we will see, they are located at a scale of 3 to 4 GeV, but they are having a width of only 30 MeV. So that means it's a 10 to the minus 3 relation. 
Because when, when they mess our nuclear fly apart, this yeah. delta, what's the kinetic energy of this new mass already messing up? Well, that you have to calculate uh, just from the available center of mass energy. So, I mean, since, the, for example, it takes rho meson as an example, that is a pi pi, two pi on resonance, mm -hmm. then certainly the two pi on share equal energy in the center of mass system. How about is it delta 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, is it very small, like the kinetic energy when the, the two fly apart? Uh, well, here, take this as an example. The rest mass of the pion is 140 MeV, so 280 MeV are sitting in the, re in the rest masses of the pions and the rest is kinetic energy and that is shared equally, so that means it's about 400 MeV total kinetic energy, 200 of, uh, for each of them, about that. And here, for those states in the Charm sector, there are the D, D, the D mesons, so to say, the Charm counterparts to the pions are the decay, the decay channels. They are having a uh, um, rest mass of about 17, 1800 MeV. So that means they are very small, uh, low actually. So that is just close to the threshold, so they are almost at rest when this decays. So for, for some of these systems it's relativistic, whereas for other, for other systems it's, it's not Right, it's not relativistic, systems. yes. Hans Werder did calculations in effective field theory here, mm -hmm. not for this particular state, but for the charm states, for example. And that is a general observation that um, many of those states, they are really low energy state as indicated by the close to threshold phenomena. Yeah? So that means they are, can be treated quite reliably with non-relativistic methods. Okay, let's start with, with atoms. And uh, I'm, I've tried, since we are a very mixed audience, I've tried to keep things simple and uh, not overload things with uh, theoretical or complicated expressions, so I have simple math and so on, in order to work out the essentials. And that's what we are doing here. So we, are start, we start with a simple case. <coughs> we have one open and one closed channel. So this yellow area, which I have indicated in the first <coughs> figure, that is <coughs> presenting, say, one partial wave of a scattering state. And we have one closed channel, which is this E star state, which I indicated. So that means since we are here in a scattering state, <coughs> the, the total energy of the system is E, then we have to expand the wave function into these two basis sets. So that is the discrete state, which cannot decay by itself. And then that is admixture of those uh, continuum states and certainly we have to integrate over those continuum states all energy contributions of those partial waves which are involved. Then you can cast that in terms of a, a Hamiltonian matrix. So we have a two by two system, so to say, which uh, is governed by, determined by a Hamiltonian H and the matrix elements are defined here and there is a particular normalization chosen for those continuum states, for those scattering states. Normally you find that these uh, states are normalized to delta k minus k prime, that means to momenta. Here it's more convenient to normalize it to a, a delta function in the energy just to keep the units in the same manner as uh, here for the <coughs> for the bound state. Is phi an, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian? Phi represents the wave function of the bound state. So is it an uh, eigenstate of uh, the Hamiltonian? It's an eigenstate of the uncoupled Hamiltonian. Mm. Well, what do you mean? Uh, I mean is a phi eigenstate of H? Because yes, no. yes. If, it's, if it is, then the second equation should be zero. No, 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 no. There is a diagonal that, that you have to read in such a way that there is a diagonal matrix element of H. 
Oh, so phi is not eigenspin no. That is the eigenstates which we are going to calculate. This is, has an expectation value of h which gives the unperturbed energy of, so h of the power. So h is, yeah, okay, so I, would, I should have pulled it down. So the, the h consists of various pieces. Yeah? So you have an, a part of the Hamiltonian acting on the bound state, you have a part of the Hamiltonian acting in the scattering state, and you have a coupling term in the Hamiltonian. Yeah? And so, and that part which is projecting on the bound state, and that you have to read it in this way, that is then having the unperturbed eigenvalue E phi, which is a discrete value. Here you have a coupling, and then you have an expectation value for these continuum states. So, and Based on those equations, you can derive the eigenvalue equation, which is of this type down here. And so you're integrating out all those wave functions, and what you are left with, together with these relations, is a relation uh, for the, it's an eigenvalue equation in particular, because in fact this is a scattering solution at positive energy. It's a, it's a boundary value problem which we have to solve. And uh, this equation here, therefore, is an equation determining the coefficients, these expansion coefficients here, together with the total normalization of the wave function. So therefore, we are having here one equation, which are relating a and these b coefficients. And we are having another equation down here, which is uh, and we have a total normalization condition. So these are the conditions which are fixing these coupling constants. And if you solve that... Is, is E a, a real number? Or a it's a real number, yes. Because we assume that this is an emission operator. So, and then you find that this expansion coefficient describing the admixtures of those continuum solutions can be, re is represented by a principal value part and a delta function part, and the delta function part carries some amplitude z of e, which is not yet determined by this equation here, but, and you see there's a relation between the a, the a and the b coefficients, the bound state or the blocked state and the uh, continuum state. And <coughs> So inverting this expression into the equations which we have seen on the previous slides, then one finds a relation like this, which fixes then the, uh, the, the yet unknown z of e part. And one finds also this principal value part leads here to an energy shift function, which is given by a principal Cauchy principal value integral of this type, namely by integrating this coupling matrix element over all energies weighted by the principal, by the Cauchy principal value nominator. In a different notation, you can also express that in terms of green functions. And then what you find here is the typical decomposition of the green function, 1 over e minus h, or uh, e minus h plus minus i epsilon and uh, that uh, can be decomposed then in these two pieces. So, and this equation here that, is, that serves to fix the coefficient z of e, and this coefficient z of e is then of this type, which is simply a relation of energies. And then by the normalization condition, one obtains an expression for the un yet unknown a coefficients multiplying or giving the weight to the bound state part. And that has then finally inserting all those results which we have found, a very intuitive, intriguing structure, namely a square of an energy difference plus the square of some other or the force power of a of another of this coupling matrix element and there is the second power of that coupling matrix element and if you uh, look to this formula a little bit longer than you realize for the moment then you realize that this is a bright Wigner type or Lorentz type curve which has a, 
uh, the k or th uh, is, is determined by a, a width which is given or the square of the width is given by this expression and it's given by a, a position of the resonance which is the root of the expression there. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, the third dimension, I saw that here phi and v is the same dimension. Yes. But here you have square and false. Yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I have to to take into account those relations here, yeah, and uh, no, but uh, but still here e phi and e yeah uh, yeah, but you see ah, that no, no, yes, yes, that yes, e yes, is uh, normalized to be independent, have to carry uh, the no dimensions, yeah. yeah, so and that makes yeah. things a little bit different as we Wait, expected. So Okay, so <laughs> this one. Um, one more, I guess. Yeah. One more equation. One more, one more equation. <laughs> the, the one with all the, the, the matrix elements. Yeah, there we go. Ah, okay, that one. So this last line, it looks like the left hand side has units of energy, and the right hand side has un is dimensionless. Uh, yeah, because you kind of have says that your wave function carries some energy part. Uh, there are still the A. Uh, and what what is about the A? And uh, uh, let me see. Up, wrong direction. So that's that's the A, uh, and that is carrying the dimension of one per one over energy, or in this case, energy squared. Uh, and so if you take that into account, then <coughs> things are, this is 1 over the energy, so that is dimensionless, this becomes dimensionless, and this becomes dimensionless. Uh, so it's a convenient notation for those uh, evaluations, but maybe not the standard one which you are used to. But believe me, dimensions are fixed and correct. So that is the conclusion, uh, or the most important final result. This coupling to the continuum leads to, a f so uh, let's start a step before. So we had a state which, if it wouldn't know about the surrounding continuum, would live forever because it's a discrete state which cannot decay by itself. It only can decay because it's coupled to the continuum, and this continuum coupling effect first of all leads to an energy shift, so the pole of this Lorentz curve, or the maximum of the Lorentz curve, is no longer by the unperturbed energy of the discrete state, but it shifted, and the thing <laughs> becomes a width, or the width certainly is related to a lifetime, and the infinite lifetime of the initial, or the this, uh, uh, the state by itself is reduced to a finite lifetime, which is essentially determined by the square of this coupling matrix element which we have introduced. Well, and this is a Lorentz shape with a width, a full width, half maximum, <coughs> which you can read off from this formula there. So that is a very simple and natural explanation how this, uh, how those states. Uh, immersed in, in a continuum of scattering states, get a finite lifetime and the width. And so that is Farno's explanation uh, why the delta resonance has a width, why the self ionizing states in atomic physics become, have a width, and so on. So now we can go back to, to the considering the open channel wave function again. What do we know if, the, if we are far away from the interaction part, from the scattering center where the interaction takes place, we know that 
the wave function or that part of the, int of the wave function expressing the coupling to the continuum must be of the form as given here, namely by a standing wave having a scattering phase shift by, so to say, initial final state interactions and an additional phase shift which, which comes from the coupling to the bound state. So it's not only that the bound state is modified from infinite lifetime to finite lifetime, but also the scattering state is certainly modified because that's intrinsically a coupled channel problem which we are solving here. And this interaction phase shift can be, is found to be related to this uh, z function which we have introduced before. And if one uh, inserts this, that is then given by half of the width of the state, yeah, because this here is uh, half the width, and the energy denominator, as one know it, is, is known from scattering theory in general, if you are close to a resonance. Yeah, and you see that the resonance only occurs because there is this coupling. If that vanishes, the coupling is not present, then this phase shift vanishes. And then certainly also this one here vanishes, the shift. So that is another important message that the, we have a modification of the scattering state as well. And <coughs> so then we can insert now our results back into this equation for the spectral amplitude, so that is the spectral amplitude of the scattering state uh, expressed here in terms of units of the A amplitude, of the spectroscopic amplitude of the bound state. And then we can now re-express everything in terms of that scattering, res of that interaction phase shift, configuration, mixing phase shift, you could say. So A is then given by the sine delta of that phase, the sine of that phase shift divided by the square root of the width. And this expression there can be expressed by, uh, well, in this way here. So I don't have to repeat this. Uh, and there's the sine part and the cosine part. The sine part is attached to this principal value. And the cosine part is then uh, attached to the delta function. So now we, since we have now an explicit expression, we can integrate out the wave function and represent them. So the question is now, how can we observe those things? And that means what happens when such a final state is excited by an external probe? So the, the excitation goes, say, into the discrete, into the bound state part. How can that be done? That can be done either by inelastic electron scattering, so you're exchanging here a virtual photon and exciting, say, a helium atom into a self-ionizing state. And that decays then in uh, helium uh, simply ionized and an electron. Or you can excite it directly by a real photon lifting the uh, or exciting the state directly. So, and now that independent of what physical process we have chosen, we can always define a transition operator connecting the initial state, namely electron atom, for example, uh, to the final state, which is this mixed wave function which we have introduced. And with our results for those expansion coefficients, we find that this can be this matrix element is split up in two pieces, which separate in this representation very nicely the pieces or the, those contributions which are coming from those interaction phase shifts here. And the first piece that is, so to say, the modified bound state. Namely, it's dressed, so that is the initial bare brown state, but it's dressed now by a certain virtual cloud, because that is a principal value integral, so that is virtual quantum mechanically dressed by a cloud of continuum states. So that means the bound state is no longer the original bound state, but it gets a more complicated object. And because it polarizes, so to say, the continuum and has a polarization cloud of continuum states around it. And there's another piece 
which is the direct uh, excitation of this unbound continuum state, which is the final state here in the, uh, in the in that type of diagram. So we have two pieces in this matrix element, and clearly the cross section is the the square of that expression, and that is then interfering. Yeah, Hans Werner. This, but the splitting this into these two contributions, this is model dependent, right? No, I mean, that is quite general. But you, you have an effected, I mean, if, if you, a different way of describing the same physics, I mean, of course you, you say you immerse a bound state in, in the continuum, but isn't that the same, uh, the same physics as if you say you have some fundamental interaction and you know, this interaction generates resonances that in your bound state in the continuum is nothing different than a, a scattering resonance. No, that's different. So, so consider, different? consider hadrons. There you have a QQ bar state, which is certainly not a scattering state, but it, it's sitting in the continuum. Or consider at, uh, atoms. There you have states which are at positive energy, like the doubly excited helium atom, which cannot decay by itself. I mean, there is no way. It only decays because of the coupling to the electron single ionized helium channel. Yeah, so these are different configurations. I mean, I mean, the Hamiltonian is general. I mean, it, it, it is, a, is a way of, of choosing. Well, the model dependence, if you want so, the model dependence is that you have chosen a certain uh, presentation or, or arrangement in your Hilbert spa space. If, if but I think of the role, the role is a scattering yes. resonance in pi pi scattering. Isn't that true? Well, that is also, if you go, if you listen to the Dyson Schwinger people, to the lattice people, then there is a QQ bar or maybe a four, uh, a QQ bar, QQ bar, four quark state by itself. And that is coupled, it gets the resonance or the width because it's coupled to the pi pi continuum. That is most, wait a moment, when but I'm but coming to hadron physics. I mean, so you, of course, of course the, the row in, in, in QCD, it's not, it's not really a Q, Q bar bound state, right? It's much more complicated than that. That's the complication. Yeah, but I think that's not the full complication you describe it. <laughs> Well, you may always add more complicated effects, but that is what, uh, what, what, the, what this type of approach tells you. There was initially a bare bound state, confined, bound, or whatsoever, blocked by the continuum, and then it becomes dressed. And you see, this is now the simplest case, where you have only one open channel. If there are many open channels, then certainly the dressing is much more complicated, and uh, the structure of the state becomes more involved. And the important message is also that this coupling of the stay of to the continuum shifts the energy position of the resonance. Yeah. So if the lattice QCD people tell us that the, there's a QQ bar state representing the row at a certain energy, then this energy will be shifted because of the coupling to the pi pi continuum. Yeah, that, that, that's my point somehow. They, they won't really tell us there is a QQ bar state. They start with some QQ bar source and then they let this propagate and they look... They have the automatically state. included those effects because they are looking for the propagation on their lattice and extracting phase shifts uh, because they have also this other component included nowadays at least. Huh? Yeah. But, but if you just measure a resonance, um, I want to describe that and this is one way of describing that, but it's not necessarily that it's exactly that nature. Distinguish that from something else. Just measuring yeah, what we will see are, there, are, there are clear predictions. Le wait for the next transparency. Yeah, so not all, not you're right. Not every resonance is a final resonance. That would be trivial, so to say. Yeah. Well, let me ask a related question. Is it obvious that this integral that appears there is independent? It's uh, converges into a survival. Yeah, yeah, that you have to take care. Certainly, I mean, this is uh, representative of. Uh, of this of this principal value, if you want to e really to evaluate that integral, 
you have to probably go to a subtraction scheme and introduce form factors and uh, discuss the energy dependence of that, uh, of that coupling matrix element. You're right. I have left out those complications, which I yeah, consider yeah, technical. You know, this is going to depend on the cutoff procedure, and that's the point I think that uh, Hans was trying to make, that it's more of dependent in the sense that it's just uh, the object on the left-hand side that has something to do with observables, and this decomposition depends on what you choose to do, right? That, that might be so, yeah. But, I mean, you don't have to... Re to solve this equation, you can uh, have other approaches. In nuclear physics, it's much better to convert all those uh, problems into a coupled radial equation. Then you have automatically taken care of those effects. And uh, so, I mean, there are technical methods which you can uh, deal with and uh, take care of those complications. But you're right. In principle, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Ask yeah. Uh, just the following up. Oops. So in this uh, derivation, bound state in the continuum. You have this frequently this uh, 1 over E minus E prime. Yes. yes. When this is under integral, usually we just add a principle. Yes, uh, there is a principle value. Yeah, I mean, I'm just not so familiar with this. Why? Because uh, if it's uh, from a Green's function, I analytically go into the complex plane, then I know this must be a uh, yeah, so but, <coughs> but if we don't do that, is there any right. reason to you are, Well, you, are, you can do it differently. You can integrate it in the complex plane and close a circle, maybe. But you can here, for these purposes, it's, it's more convenient to split it up into an integral over the real axis and an integral over the complex plane. And then the one part is giving you the delta function and the second part is this is giving the principal value integral. Yeah? So, I mean, if I don't do this very carefully, every time I see this, I simply assume <laughs> it's a principal value part, yeah? Yes, yes. But that, that you can treat that even numerically very reliably. Uh, that is, it's not a, it's not a matter of, uh, of principal. Or it, it, it doesn't prevent or hinder you to evaluate those. Yeah, expressions. we were told by some people that uh, you have to choose a grid point which is symmetrical with this. Well, the most convenient method for numerical evaluation of a principal value integral is that you simply add, okay, you have here some function f of e prime, and then you add plus minus f of e e minus e prime and that results then in f of e prime minus f of e over e minus e prime plus a contribution which vanishes because this one if you uh, have the second contribution then you have an integral over 1 minus e minus e prime and if it's symmetric you have to do it symmetrically this gives a logarithm and that vanishes. I would like to make a comment about this uh, numerical integration. So there's an even simpler method uh, without doing the subtraction. So, so what is it? A, yeah, a, a simpler method. You, you, uh, yeah, yeah okay. we can discuss in the afternoon. Yes. Yeah, maybe we, uh, I would like to. There are other methods <laughs> as well. <laughs> there are other methods as well. There's something even simpler than this. Yeah. yeah. Some, yeah we okay. Can Good. Maybe that's something for the afternoon. <laughs> okay. So that uh, we have to keep an eye on the clock, I guess. So uh, now our transition matrix element from the initial channel A alpha to the channel X to channel beta. Uh, so that's, for example, electron plus uh, atom. And that is here the decaying uh, state. So that we can represent, or Fano decided to represent it in this way as I've written down it here. So he took out this transition into the scattering continuum and uh, also that part uh, or the sine delta part and then what is left is a ratio of matrix elements and the cotangent of this additional phase shift, this interaction phase shift. And that leads then to the famous Fano formula, namely that you 
have the non-resonant scattering into the continuum. So that is simply electron uh, at, uh, atom scattering. And then you express all those effects which are coming here from the interactions by the, f the interaction phase shift delta and this ratio of matrix elements which are measuring, so to say, the strength of the transition from this modified bound state relative to the unperturbed continuum. So that is the dressed bound state with this virtual cloud of continuum dressed. And that one here is the undressed the bare um, continuum. So, and now this tells us, well, and this Q parameter, you can read it off there. That is simply this. So that might be a complex quantity. In uh, simple cases, it's a real number, but it might be also a complex quantity. And <coughs> this non-resonant cross-section, except of phase space factors, which I haven't shown, that is simply here given by 1 over the, the width, or the square root of the width of the state, and this matrix element leading into the unperturbed continuum. So that is now the description of Fano, say, for example, for the rho meson resonance. You excite the two pi on continuum, and you have a modification of that cross-section coming from the presence of this QCD type, QQ bar configuration, or maybe four quark configuration. Yeah, so that is the formula. So and typical Fano resonances are having those shapes. And that is your question. Not or not every resonance is a Fano resonance. Well, I was getting into it. Somehow suggesting that you can put the row solely as that kind of resonance just by giving us the samples in one of the slides. And I think Antonio's point was that in general it's more complicated. You can't really tell just from seeing the resonance from these capacity. Yeah, so right. But you can since there's always the sine delta involved or this uh, coupling phase shift, and since the coupling is not very strong, that's what one observes. I mean, you don't read it from the formula. Uh, so that is then, and that is a small resonance, and it has typically such asymmetric line shapes, where you have, if there's only a single ch uh, open channel which, which puts the cross section down to zero at a certain energy which is determined by the value of that Q parameter. Now the Q parameter, since these resonances, as I said, they are the width <coughs> compared to the position is, say, 1%, 1 per mil or so, and uh, around the width, you ca over the width of the resonance, you can consider this Q parameter as a constant. And therefore, that measures, so to say, the relative contributions of the bound to continuum excitation uh, here at the resonance position. And so these are the typical line shapes. And so that was at that time in the late, in the early 60s, the famous silverman lassetre data, because they observed in helium, in, elect in elastic elements sc scattering in helium, such line shapes, which are not <coughs> At, until that time, one was expecting that resonances are of Laurentian or Breitwigner shape. And that was an unexpected result. And that initiated Fano to consider what could happen in such cases. And one, was, one knew that this particular state here is a, is a state which cannot decay by itself. It's a double excited helium. Both electrons are lifted in some excited state, but they are still sitting below threshold. So none of them can escape, but the total energy of the excited state here is above threshold. And so that's just this phenomenon. And uh, so if you consider here, the resonance position is somehow 60 uh, electron volts, the width is 0.04 electron volts, so it's 1% uh, or so, very sharp resonance and a very asymmetric resonance. And uh, uh, the analysis of Fano revealed that this uh, Q squared is given by this number. And if you evaluate that, then and by the fact that the resonance, the, the asymmetry, the dip appears on the right hand side of the resonance, one knows that the Q must be negative. That is a value of Q of 1.85. So you have a 
strong excitation into the bound state, the matrix element is uh, into the dressed bound state is apparently larger than the matrix element in the electron single ionized um, helium atom. So that is what one finds experimentally. Yeah, right, because, well, it's, it's yeah. Fano's choice. It's uh, actually, it's the resonance formula depends on the modulus of the Q minus co cotangent delta. Oops, the other direction. Uh, so this one here. So it's depending on Q. Q mm. might be a complex number. So <laughs> and then certainly things are getting a little bit more complicated. I'm going to discuss that. But also here you see, since this dip is not really going to zero, there is some other continuum contribution below, beneath it. And that you might express, in fact, as a complex number of uh, Q, Comple uh, an imaginary part of Q. So. That is, since then, this is very well established in atomic physics, also in laser physics. And uh, there's a recent, namely from last year, paper in science where people took up those things and realized that if they have now this modern technique of attosecond lasers, that they can, so to say, model, simulate those Fano interactions by short time uh, laser pulses. Yeah, so there are Again, helium, that is their uh, system of choice. Yeah, so if you have a broadband laser, femtosecond laser, you get here a nice spectrum of Fano resonances. And the red line is the uh, corresponding calculation. It's a multi-channel calculation, a little bit more complicated than I was discussing it. And <coughs> then you can, uh, that is for the single uh, excited uh, helium, and then you add, so to say, here to this broadband femtosecond laser a short pulse of attosecond laser, a very sharp pulse, and then you can compensate these configuration interactions and going back to the Fano line. And that means that you have changed your Q parameter to larger values. If that Q goes to infinity, you are back to the, to the uh, Lorentz uh, curve. And vice versa, yeah, you can uh, here in the single excited helium, we observe a nice spectrum of uh, Lorentz type line shapes. And if you shoot, in addition, uh, attosecond laser, then these change into Fano resonances of this type because that starts to mix the bound state or the single excited states more strongly with the continuum. And that is a, so it's a science paper from last year. So. Kind of a summary of what I have discussed until now. So what is this uh, quantum interference in continuum states? You have, starting from a ground state with some external probe, you are entering, you are exciting a discrete state, which is not decaying by itself, has an infinite lifetime. But you can also go through the energetically degenerate continuum of the same quantum numbers, maybe. And then there is a crosstalk between these two, and that gives them those typical line shapes with a very small width and a pronounced asymmetry in the line shape deviating from the Lorentz curve expectation of normal resonances. So, final resonances in nuclei, well, I don't repeat fully the theory because the basic theory is essentially the same. Here, sometimes, if you want to uh, really also take account of the modifications of the wave functions, some t in also in weakly bound nuclei, one should distinguish, or one good way to describe those systems is that one has scattering states and additional particle bound states to a the core nucleus in a ground state. And you have. Um, so these are these um, configurations which we have formally called uh, the KIEs. And you have configurations by which the core nucleus is excited and the particle is attached to it maybe.
but uh, neither of the particles is above particle threshold as I have discussed it for the helium case. The wave function can be then written in the way that you have a superposition of the additional sub-threshold states. And as we have seen here, the same expression as before, above threshold scattering states. And then you have those closed channels, which was formerly called the phi component. And these may be not, in, in the general case, you have a sum over all possible states and these are core excited states so that, that, that say the carbon 12 is not if you take carbon 12 as an example it's not only in its ground state but it can be excited into the two plus state one minus one plus three minus states whatsoever and then you have can attach the particle to it and describe carbon 13 in this way for example uh, so then we are having a hamiltonian matrix here so here i actually have now labeled with uh, the various uh, qu or, or sub-channel quantum numbers. So there is some Hamiltonian uh, of these bound states or eigenstates of this core nucleus in its ground state. Then the scattering states or eigenstates of the scattering part of the Hamiltonian. And then you have a coupling here. And the, these are the different, the energy with respect to the nucleus to the core nucleus in the, its ground state and here these core excited states you have to subtract the core excitation energy and you see that if the core excitation energy is large enough then this one here gets a negative impression and the channel is closed. Okay so if we assume that the bound states uh, and the scattering states belong to the same Hamiltonian, then there is no explicit coupling and you have a reduced matrix element, uh, Hamiltonian matrix, which is uh, much simpler or a little bit simpler to treat. And in that case, we have equations of this type. So that means the single particle motion with respect to the ground state of the nucleus is described by those equations modified. So these are the unperturbed parts of the Hamiltonian, so H11, H22, and then they are modified by the coupling to, the, to these uh, core excited states, which uh, might also involve some integral if there is a continuous distribution. So and then these uh, closed channels represented by the core excited states, they certainly are coupled to both parts of the single particle motion and are being modified and that has to be then solved uh, as a couple channel problem. You can solve it in a matrix representation. In nuclear physics it's sometimes convenient to solve it really in terms of a couple differential equation in, in, in uh, uh, coordinate space. And uh, <coughs> so if we look for the Fano theory and trying to understand what happens when I'm adding more open channels to the system. Uh, so the next step to the case of several open channels is certainly to have two open channels. And um, <coughs> then there are two open channels and there are two energetically degenerate solutions with having, having outgoing flux. And again, these are these uh, matrices. Now we have a second piece given here or expressed by W. And then we have partial widths, so there's a coupling from the channel 1 to the bound state component, from the channel 2 to the bound state component, that is then related uh, to a partial width gamma 1, partial width gamma 2. The total width of the state will become the sum of all these partial widths. Then the configuration, um, the, the uh, interaction phase shift is then given by the total width and a modified uh, shift function, energy shift function, which is the principal value integral integrating out the total width. So that means now one gets dressing, so to say, of both from both channels to the bound state to the closed channel. That is the essence. And the width is getting larger because you have an additional channel which is open asymptotically, which adds naturally to the width of the state. And those configuration amplitudes 
they are, well, the basic part is still the same as before, but these partial uh, configuration amplitudes, they are now modified by the ratio of the partial width to the total width. Here there should be a 2 actually in index 2. Otherwise the energy dependence is as before. And there's a second solution which is only a mixing the continuum states through the coupling to the um, bound state. And uh, that is given by here. So actually also here there's a printing error. So the square root is only related to the partial bits to this fractional population of the channel. That you can interpret this gamma i over gamma as the fractional population of that particular channel. Okay, and this produces here a smoothly varying background and uh, on which the resonance is sitting. Here I have simulated those effects and the blue curve that is a case where we have no, we have only one open channel, no background contribution, and the other two curves, there are varying contributions of the, or coupling uh, strengths are, is varied, and the, uh, you see if the coupling strength, so if that increases from here to here certainly increases, then you are approaching a more symmetric line shape, and the important message is, so experimentalists, what, how, do, how do they like to interpret or to analyze data? They introduce a resonance and they introduce an incoherent background typically. And that is a fatal approach, at least for those cases here, because things are interfering and you have to take into account this uh, interference, the quantum interference effect uh, very precisely. So. <coughs> So we have applied those things to nuclear physics. A nice case are the carbon isotopes. The carbon isotopes, if you go away from carbon-12, they are easily dipole polarizable and in particular quadrupole polarizable. These are theoretical calculations. So this is a particular approach for the ground state, mean field approach, Hartree-Fockburg-Lyubov, and excited states are calculated in the so-called a QRPA approach, a quasi-particle random phase approximation, and these polarizabilities are defined in terms of the polarization sum rule and the non-energy weighted sum rule. And you see, if you go away from stability, so these are very exotic carbon isotopes, very short-lived, they are better decaying, they are, can only be produced at rare isotope facilities, then you have a very strong increase in these polarizabilities. And that means if you are interact with these nuclei, you easily excite them into, into other states and uh, so producing very easily those closed channels. The effect of those type of correlations is that uh, there's no longer a spectral distribution represented by the shell model. The shell model spectral distribution would, for example, be for the 1S state a single delta function where the peak is at the position of the mean field energy of the state. If you switch on those correlations, which we have discussed yesterday, by the way, then you see that the 1S state is no longer a single state, but becomes a distribution of states distributed <coughs> over 20 or more MeV. And uh, then there is also a small part uh, 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 the 2S state, which is because here at the Fermi surface, the level density of these excited states is very low. It's a very sharp state, and that is reminiscent of the delta function, which you see here. But if you are going away from the Fermi surface, then you have uh, correlation effects, like producing such broadly distributed energy uh, spectral distributions. The same thing or similar things are happening in the continuum. So there's uh, the carbon-15 ground state, which is, uh, well, the energy scale is normalized to, to that ground state. And here the continuum starts, and you see there is a broad distribution of continuum states. But then suddenly sharp states are popping up out of the background. And these are candidates for those Fano states because these are co-excited states to which uh, particles are attached and they cannot escape. 
And so again, this is a type of equation, system of equation which we have to solve. So it looks very similar to what we have seen before. And now, since I'm going to discuss an example, I tell for the specialist uh, that certain states in core excitations in CARM 14 are of particular importance in those polarization mm -hmm. correlation effects. And that is shown below here. And uh, so uh, nuclear physics, we have various possibilities to excite those states. You can do it by elastic scattering and from a resonance there. You can use the so-called transfer reactions where one particle from the projectile is transferred to the target and forming then, so to say, this part here in an intermediate, as an intermediate reaction step. And you can excite things inelastically. And uh, so these are the basic ways how we can study nuclear physics, but also in atomic physics, certainly resonances, except maybe of the transfer. So uh, that is the result of our calculation that is shown here. I'm not going into the detail. But of interest is uh, that there are also data. So there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there is a close enough correspondence that one can say that indeed, experimentally, one has observed those resonances. So the energy resolution is certainly not ideal in this case. And uh, so th uh, that one would have to take into account. And if you analyze those resonances, then you find that <coughs> they are having a width between, say, around 100 keV on a scale of 10 MeV. So it's, uh, again, a width to a position relation, to pole position relation of 10 to the minus 3, and uh, which is typical for those Fano resonances. Uh, in view of the time, I skip that part here and going to the to hadron physics as a final example. So what is uh, the interest there, or what, what do we find there? So there is Shamonium. The Shamonium spectrum, that is a, uh, a charmed quark and a, anti a charmed antiquark forming together some resonance, or some states, better to say. That is the known Shamonium spectrum below the D anti D meson resonance. And here it's compared on the other side to the positronium spectrum. So that is on the scale of 3 point something GeV. That is on the scale of 4 to 1 or, say, 5 electron volt. And there is a striking similarity, not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but a striking similarity. And so that means, indeed, this CC bar system behaves quite universal. You find the same features, same basic features, also in quite a different system, namely the positronium, the E plus E minus system, which may also form bound states, Coulomb states. So, and that led uh, Eichten Gottfried and, sp and later on Iskua Gottfried to postulate a potential model, a quark, anti-quark potential model which consists here of a coulombic part, which simulates the gluon exchange. Gluons are like photons. They are massless. They are vector fields, gauge fields of the uh, strong interaction. And then one has to take care of the confinement of quarks, the fact that they cannot be separated. That is done in terms of a linear uh, increasing potential and maybe some shift constant C, which is of no importance. So the potential looks like this. There we can identify this gluon exchange region at very small, say below 0.5 femtometers, and the confinement region, which is uh, the larger radial part. So we are talking about the two systems, actually, shamonium and botonium. Both are of the same nature and obeying the same type of dynamics and are related to the E plus E minus positronium system. The Charmonium, the Charmed quark, has a mass of 1.2 GeV, the bottom quark of 4.8 GeV, 
and uh, the corresponding values of the strong coupling constants are given here, so they are not that big. And <coughs> uh, that is uh, the, uh, the increase here, the, uh, the slope of the confining potential or the string tension. And uh, so that the typical energy interval there finds, where one finds the Charmonium CC bar states, that is the typical energy region where one finds the corresponding Bottonium BB bar states. So we have three states, three quite different systems which are of the same type of uh, dynamics, uh, obeying the same type of dynamics. Were those values for sigma determined by fitting the observed spectra? Sorry, see? The, the values for sigma you gave for yeah, that. Yeah, that's right, they're fit constant. Okay. Yeah. But you can relate them also nowadays to uh, lattice QCD results. Uh, so that's uh, one of their work that one extracts those parameters from lattice QCD. They don't do need to do so, but it's interesting to compare it. So now let's uh, confine our the discussion to uh, the charmonium sector and close to threshold in particular. So there's this famous J psi state that is on the 1s state of CC bar. That uh, was first dis discovered in, uh, 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 was the first discovered state and the first uh, indication for the presence of the charmed quark. And uh, from there on, things are were starting. So I have plotted the same figure as you have seen before here again, and now overlaid the situation which we find at the uh, threshold where the so-called open charm threshold opens, namely the d0, d0, anti d0 mesons, the d plus, d minus mesons. And uh, so those thresholds, they are here located at those energies. So that means they are only a, a part by 10 MeV on the scale of uh, 3.7 GeV. That means we have at least two continua, maybe a third continuum, which is a little bit higher. That is the, uh, 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 the vector meson partner to the D meson partner. So the D mesons here, they are kind of the partners of the, to the pions from low energy physics. The D star mesons, these are the partners for the uh, rho meson or the vector mesons which you find in low energy physics. And uh, then the experimental result is that close to threshold you find a distribution that is a psi prime or the psi 2s. And within the Fano approach we can show that there is a CC bar component located somewhere in the continuum that starts to interact with these two continua it gets a positive uh, a negative energy contribution that is this f of e part, the mass shift that lowers this state below threshold and produces above threshold a resonance and so how can we uh, excite those states they are good so okay let's first discuss the wave functions so the, the, the wave functions of this uh, <coughs> state in the continuum is given here, so always have the CC bar component and then this coupling to the DD bar uh, scattering continuum. There's this bound state, so the lowered state, and there's this resonance state above the particle threshold, and they have certainly different uh, uh, weights in these uh, coefficients, but I mean, uh, since they must be normalized, they are related. How can we excite those states? Oops, that was the wrong direction. Well, that is certainly be, uh, that can be done by E plus E minus annihilation. So there is BES, uh, the BES facility in, in Beijing. There's Bell, there's Barbar, and all those things. And you have an E plus E minus annihilation that annihilates in a virtual photon far off the mass shell or energy shell and that materializes then in a CC bar state. So that means it excites the CC bar component here, and uh, that component is then coupled to the um, continuum, and so that's what BES is doing. 
And uh, following the Fano approach, now in a relativistic invariant, uh, Lorentz invariant manner, so we have to replace energies by Lorentz invariant quantities, and that is the Mandelstam variable s, and also the shift functions and the widths become now f as uh, can be expressed as a function of s. And we have introduced here the modification of this Mandelstam variable, which is the available center of mass energy by the uh, mass shift delta m. That is, as before, given by the principal value integral over the, the widths. And then you have here the best type cross sections, E plus and minus annihilation, into finally dd bar. That is this direct dd bar excitation, the background cross-section, and then they have a, an expression as we had it before. So it should be absolute uh, modulus and not the square. And uh, again, the parameter q, which appears here, is now a measure of the dressed cc bar state, dressed by this virtual cloud of dd bar mesons, with respect to the excitation of the dd bar continuum. So that is our result for those calculations, so for, for, for the analysis of those data. And that is here the close. So here again, I have indicated the threshold. So these are the 10 MeV apart, the two thresholds. And you see that there's a pronounced dip, really put, also experimentally putting the cross section to zero. And that can only be understood by that interference effect. Otherwise, there is no way how you can put the cross section to zero. And there is another state always discussed, the so called X390 state, which might be here. We would say this is not a resonance, but it's simply a structure which is produced due to the interaction of those states with this continuum. And here it's uh, again a dip from the next higher state. And so it, that would not be, in our understanding, not be a resonance by itself. So, and the corresponding value of Q is a real value. It's minus 2.1 plus an uncertainty, which comes from the experimental uncertainties. And so there's, uh, well, there are the so-called x, y, z states, which I'm not going to discuss. The, this Iskua. Godfrey model predicts very nicely uh, all these states, uh, many states, but uh, 10 years ago one has observed additional states which do not fit into that scheme and they, they are called x, y, z states. So that's all to the end. And I should simply say that there are at least two people have contributed to this work. Okay, thank you very much. We are out of time, if we're, so we will not have time to for this for questions. If we have questions, uh, please ask them uh, in the afternoon, or if the professor, and that's really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>